Is your child defiant, independent, annoyingly inquisitive? After a long, hard day of following the rules, who wants to deal with troublesome kids? 49% of children suffer from Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD. Symptoms of ODD include independent thought, rampant creativity, and failure to submit to authority. But now there's a solution. The good people at Pilfer can help you with their time-release, once-daily capsule, Compliacin. Your child won't be able to form his own opinions, let alone express them. It maintains your child's ability to go to a state-run school and perform simple tasks around the house. You won't have to worry about parenting, and the school won't have to deal with your kid asking questions. Compliacin. You'll go from this. Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! To this. Good morning, Mother. I love going to school. And this week we're learning all about how the government is our federal family and they're here to help us. Compliacin. Talk to your school psychiatrist and ask for it by name. Well, I think we've at least got 24 libertarians in Scotland. But what if you find out that if you're surrounded with libertarians, that they're all dicks just like everyone else? <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> there, there, there's no hope. We are just some modern-day abolitionists looking to rid the world of the last vestige of slavery, statism. It's the Seeds of Liberty podcast with Andre, Dave, and Jeremy. Everybody and welcome to the 149th episode of the Seeds of Liberty podcast. As always, we are covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse by anyone except governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at BIPCOT.org. All right, so we are back. This is Jeremy. I am joined tonight by Shane. What's going on, my friend? Hello, I'm going good. Yeah, right. Uh, Dave is Dave was supposed to join us tonight, but Dave's not here, man. And we we can all do a cheer for that. Uh, I'm sorry, just kidding. Love you, love you, buddy. Anyway, so we are back, and we have a very special guest with us today, coming in all the way from Scotland. Jesus Christmas! We have Anthony Samaroff, one of the co-hosts of the Scottish Liberty Podcast, and also the author of a wonderful book that I finally got a chance to read. Uh, fittingly, of course, Procrastination Annihilation. Anthony, thank you so much for joining us today, man. Thank you so much for having me on the Seeds of Liberty, Jeremy, and also Shane. It's really great to join you. I'm ecstatic. Can't wait to see how we do. All right, man. Yeah, well, like I said, I'm, I'm very. Gl- we're very glad you're here. Uh, I have. I've become aware of you, obviously, like many people have through listening to you on all these different. I, I had heard you mention. I had heard the Scottish Liberty podcast mentioned a while back, and I'm like, I really need to check that out because we were discussing a little bit before the show. Uh, I, I'm also a host of the Freedom Fiends, and we had a couple of Scots on the show for a little while who I just missed at the time. And uh, <laughs> when I found out there was more people over that over on that side of the pond that were interested in. Liberty. I'm like, I got to find out more about this. And then of course, life got in the way. I kind of forgot about it. And then you started popping up on all these shows and just listening to you. I'm like, we need to talk to this guy. And as luck would have it, you, uh, you talked to our, our, our former co-host, Neo Quayar recently, and you reached out to me shortly thereafter and we tried to set this up. So, uh, yeah. So for, for anybody who doesn't know, like I said, Anthony, uh, he does that podcast. He's written this book, which I did just get to read today. Uh, I actually read it in between sessions at court. Uh, that's a whole nother story. We can get into it another time. Most of them, our, fa- our fans know my ongoing struggles with that, but, uh I did get to read that. But the other thing I wanted to touch on first that uh, you just made, I guess, public the other day on Facebook is that you're actually coming to town. Well, my town, Uh, you're coming to New York in the very near future. And that's pretty exciting because you and I are hopefully going to get a chance to meet up and maybe do another, maybe take an adventure together or maybe do another recording together in person or maybe both. We'll see. Um, That's really super cool, man. So uh, is it and I'm going to let you talk, believe me. Um, But is this uh, have you been to this? I don't know. Have you been to this? States before or um or have you been to New York before or is this you just coming over here for the first time well I have been to the states before a few years ago I was there with some family on a holiday but I haven't gone on my own for over 10 years wow I feel like I'm getting 
I feel like I'm getting old. Uh, but I was in New York around the age of 20. Um, I've told you that's over 10 years ago. That's really all you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, it was cool. It's so cool to think that I'm going back there. Um, and on my own, I've been working really hard this year. And uh, people who are like, I've kind of been a little bit of a libertarian podcast whore uh, going around all the shows because my book, Procrastination Annihilation, which is free to download, by the way, from beyourselfandloveit.com forward slash do it. It only takes two hours to read. Um, and I thought it would be nice to, I was trying to get this out and, you know, I, I work in the personal development sphere. I do coaching and counseling therapy for people, depending on what their needs are. And I was working really hard on just trying to raise my profile, actually, and see if I could find ways of serving more people. And it took a while, but it's paid off. But I felt like now was a good time to do something for me, uh, to use that dreadful old cliche. Uh, I noticed that every time that I've gone on a trip in the last few years, it's always been to some personal development retreat, uh, yoga thing or um, workshops and things like that, something to work on myself. And I thought it would be nice to do something for leisure. And uh, yeah, it's been uh, just the prospect of going out there and seeing some friends is really excellent. I've had some people reach out to me through uh, the Libertarian Network and ask to meet up and vice versa I've asked to meet up with people so I'm so excited really just it's so been so it's almost surreal yeah it definitely does seem like an adventure and I'd be only too happy to meet up with you oh looks like I've got the hiccups not perfect for a podcast <laughs> ah that's all right well uh well we'll let that slide but uh yeah we'll work around them exactly um well yeah no I mean it's I mean it's always exciting for me I know I mean I I, I can't imagine because like I said in my mind I, I I've only ever heard of, of a couple of people coming from your from your neck of the woods that that think like we that I think like I do. Yeah. So I can only imagine like for me it's like oh my god of course you want to go meet you want to go see other libertarians and other anarchists and stuff because you don't have a lot of them around you. And I've you know I've felt like that for a long time. I'm stuck here in New York, which is obviously not a very um, libertarian paradise at all. Um, so you know I've always felt secluded here. And it's always great to to meet other people. I'm actually in the process of moving out of out of the state. Eventually, one of these days, I'll finally be allowed to leave. But uh, but that's why I was so. It was like it was just weird timing that I saw. It. Like you and I had started talking, uh, you know, about trying to get together and, and record something for our for the show. And then all of a sudden, you and you're like, oh yeah, uh, now I'm coming to New York. And I'm like, holy crap. This is just too perfect because like now I'm still stuck here. I'm lamenting the fact that I'm not allowed to leave New York yet. Like if it was up to me, I'd be gone already. I'd already be in the Midwest somewhere in, you know, in Indiana, but I'm not, I'm still here. And it's like, well, this is just too great. He's coming to New York. I'm still stuck here. I don't have a job. Let's go do something. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's and just by coincidence, I noticed that the Libertarian Party convention uh, for New York uh, starts just when I go to New York. So that's almost too synchronous. I feel like I might need to pop down there for the Saturday and see what it's all about. See if I can meet some people. Uh, it just seems like a stroke. Uh, it was complete synchronicity. Uh, I feel like I'm called there. I don't know what the Libertarian Party is up to now. It seems to have gone in various directions that not everyone is happy with. Uh, well, I mean, to be honest, when Gary Johnson was asked um, what he thought of Hillary Clinton and responded that she was a wonderful <laughs> public servant, I, I think that was pretty much... Uh, that pretty much did it for me, to be honest. I mean, at this time of history, not to say she's a warmonger and a scumbag, uh, uh, <laughs> was was not only, like was a pretty big tactical blunder. I know um, Tom Woods, um, great supporter of mine, um, has had me on his show three times, uh, despite me being a pretty small fish. Um, has had his run-ins with the Libertarian Party, and they they've um, some some members have. Uh, said things about him that are regrettable, but do you know what? They can't all be bad, right? No. Well, you would like to think so. Uh, <laughs> I mean, at least they're libertarians. At least kind they're of. <laughs> the, the, this is the worry, though. What You know, because I, I live in Scotland where 
there's where a libertarian is about as popular as a beef burger at a vegan potluck, right? <laughs> so, uh, so it's like I, I'm always reminded of the story Walter Block tells when he said that once he asked Murray Rothbard, how many libertarians do you think there are in the world? And Murray Rothbard was like, I don't know, about 24. Well, I think we've at least got 24 libertarians in Scotland. But what if you find out that if you're surrounded with libertarians, that they're all dicks just like everyone else? <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> there, there, there's no hope. There, there's no hope left. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just kidding. No, but, I um, gotcha. Uh, well, yeah, no, the, the Libertarian Party, like the national p level party, is, is is a mess here, obviously. I mean, anybody can see that by if they pay attention because, yeah, the people are at each other's throats. Uh, the, the, lead, the current leadership has a, seems to have a penchant for attacking long long long-standing good pe you know people that have a long-standing uh, good uh, tradition in either in the party or are supported by people of the party people like Tom Woods you know people like that who you yeah, know, even nobody Ron would question Paul, I mean who, yeah. who who who's you have to be pretty ballsy to level a criticism at Ron Paul from libertarianism of all people Wow. Exactly. I, I don't know about that. We actually have two two of our earliest podcasts were, were almost specifically about him. I think one of them was actually titled Slay, Slaying Sacred Pauls, and it was almost a three-hour episode with our buddy Lou Fien, uh, another Feed of Feeds co-host, where we kind of took apart the great man theory of Ron Paul. <laughs> Oh well, we're gonna get into a fight. No, just kidding. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll hey, have hey, to, save I'll that have for to... when we meet up. We can we can get it on video. Maybe we can sure. sell some money. World star. Yeah, World pay, star. Pay, <laughs> pay per view, man. Well, okay, I better get I better get down to the gym then. But um, yeah, no, I mean, I'd like I'd be interested in hearing that and finding out what the criticisms are. Oh sure. I always love. It's always juicy to me when someone has this. I think this is one of the things that sometimes differentiates libertarians from most people. It's like, see if we hear something that we don't know or an argument like that we've not heard before. Oh, one of someone gives us a clue that one of our positions might be wrong. It's like, oh, that sounds juicy. Like I'd, I'd like to research that. Whereas the average person is like, no, uh, what I can't. Uh, information you can see their minds start locking down and getting defensive and uh you know whatever whatever tactic anything but to have to change your mind yeah cognitive dissonance but with that said like i was a big fan of ron paul back in 2008 and by 2012 well, by 2012, he had actually introduced me to libertarianism and voluntarism, and uh, he, he led me to the door of anarchy. He might not have opened it for me, but at least he brought me to the doorway, mm. and I had to step through it myself. Yeah, he was definitely an influence on me. I mean, I've been a libertarian for like a decade now, pretty much. That's pretty amazing, almost a decade, if not quite a decade. Um, I didn't realize how far ahead of the curve I was but I think I did think I think even so I think I did think that this was this was the new thing it's it's quite embarrassing or sad to see you know the alt right appear out of nowhere and suddenly have like shed loads of them uh, and, and grow much faster than libertarianism but I think um, libertarianism is it's a slow burn but once people become a libertarian they very rarely um, go back to being a leftist or someone on the right. It's more like um, once you get it, you get it. And I think the thing with the with movements that come out of nowhere, they vanish into nowhere as well. And I think the great thing about libertarianism is it's been a slow burn, but our views are so coherent. And it's such a beautiful way of seeing the world. It's so that, um, you know, that human affairs are harmonious. As if, if I don't initiate force and you don't initiate force, if we do something voluntarily, we can both enjoy, we can both benefit. Like, that's a much better worldview than, say, the Marxist one, which says human desires are antagonistic uh, based on class lines, for example. Or the you know the, the, there's lo there's lots of ideologies that don't offer much hope in terms of because they think that human affairs are antagonistic. 
Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I agree. Yeah, I do too. And, you know, you, you know, something you said about the, the fact, you know, that this is the whole slow burn thing. I, I really like that, but it, it's true. I, I think it's true that, you know, most people, when, when presented with the ideas of libertarianism, if it's, if, if you can manage to strip away the politics from it and just present mm. the ideas of like non-aggression and, you know, voluntary interactions and stuff like that, most people will end up agreeing with you. But mm. it, then you run into, like Shane mentioned, the cognitive dissonance. And you, know, you were talking about like how you know, people just got to put their fingers in their ears when you present ideas versus mm. or when you challenge their ideas, really. You know, that's what you run into. Because a lot of times you can get, if you get like a person, you know, if you could pull a person away from the pack and speak to them on an individual level, and you can ha if you can actually manage to have a conversation with them, you find out that, yeah, most people do agree with these ideas. And that's what I think, at least for me in the beginning kept pushing me because it was like, it was, I mean, it was val It was basically validating, uh, everything that I had, I had taken in and started to believe. Cause it was like, well, yeah, okay. Now I'm presenting to this person who obviously thinks the way I used to, and they're seeing the benefits right away. They may, they may not make the full connections, but just the fact that they were like, Oh, of course I agree with that. Like that was a validation for me. It was like, well, well, I'm definitely on the right track because all these people are seeing it. Now it's just a matter of how do you actually well, I, I mean, I hate to use the word convince, but you know, you know what I mean? Like, cause my, I'm at the point now where I don't try to, I'm not a, about trying to change anybody. I mean, back when we started mm -hmm. the show and before, and even before that I was, you know, I prostel, you know, I, I preached a lot and my whole goal was, you know, conversion type things. And I've definitely stepped away from that. My whole, I'm more, much more about trying to lead by example these days. Um, but we were actually, we were talking a little bit before the show about, you know, doing different podcasts and the fact that there's so many of libertarian podcasts out there and like competition and, you know, numbers and the, who's actually listening to type of thing. And for me, the, the one reason that I do keep doing this show, even though, I mean, we've talked about this on the show before, so it's not like I'm letting out company secrets or anything, but like, you know, we took a hit numbers wise last year and it's mo it's completely our fault. Like you know, the three of us got lazy, you know, we don't, we're not blaming Shane and wasn't Shane wasn't here yet, yet, yet here. So it's not your fault, Shane, but Dave, Andre and I, you know, we let, we, we dropped the ball. And so it's our, it's our fault. But the reason that we kept pushing, that I kept pushing forward, even, you know, even if the numbers dropped even further, for me, I keep doing it because I, I've been lucky enough that at least every month or two, I get reminded mm. that I am making a dent somewhere because every month or two, I find somebody who I've, ne I've never talked to, never, like, never heard from, all of a sudden contacts me and is like, hey, I, uh, you know, I heard the show and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I, ju I just found your show and I really dig it. And it's like, holy crap, like we're still like, and they, they speak about specific points I made. And a number, mm. of a number of people like, you know, a number of people have actually said they, you know, if they're going to count anybody as their red pill, like it's me. And like, wow, that's excellent. Yeah. And like to hear that from anybody is insane. Like, you know, and it's not, not in an egotistical way for me. It's just like, holy shit, like this, what we're doing actually matters. It may not matter to a whole hell of a lot of people right now, but it matters to somebody and it's making mm -hmm. a difference. And, you know, Shane, for example, he's talked about this before. He started talking about it earlier that, you know, he, we, some of us were already doing these things when he came along to us and through listening to, through uh, Danilo, uh, my, our former former co-host and the stuff right. that we were doing at the Seeds of Liberty, it kind of helped push him along too. Uh, the next guest we actually have lined up uh, after we do this show is a, a returning guest from us, one of our original fans who came to us and reached out and was like, holy crap, nice. like we're an we, I'm an anarchist now, thanks to you guys, basically. And I, even even better, her mother is now an anarchist because of us. And her, I think her mom's, an even, her mom's an awesome. even bigger fan than she is, um, which is awesome. But like I get, rem and, 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 and then people like that, people who have come to me in the past that I'm still friends with, like I've become friends with now, like every once in a while, these I get reminded of these stories. It's like, yeah, man, I mean, we could just be, you know, blowing uh blowing smoke most of the time or just like yapping to hear ourselves yap but somebody's listening and, and it's making an impact and for me that's why i keep doing it because obviously you don't make money in this fucking game anybody who thinks they can make money in the po pod the podcasting game in general but specifically the libertarian podcasting game unless your name is tom woods um you're gonna have a really hard time <laughs> 
<laughs> monetizing this shit. Yeah, and by the way, that's uh, just in a manner of speaking, please don't go out and change your name to Tom Woods and then uh, start a libertarian podcast because uh, there that's just not going to work. There isn't really enough space in the sphere for two. <laughs> well, he is anti-IP. I'd like to see how he would deal with that, though. <laughs> yeah. But as Jeremy said, um, this show was an influence on me. And former co-host of this show, uh, Danilo Cuellar, who you were just on his other podcast, Peaceful Anarchism, uh, he was my red pill. So, right. Yeah. Yes, and Danilo, I mean, he's a great guy. I've been on his show twice. And... Um, he's got such a wonderful energy and attitude about him. He's usually got a great big smile on his face. He loves the peaceful part of peaceful anarchism, uh, the, the, the voluntarist principle. You know, when I was on the Tom Woods show, I think it was my third appearance. I'm not bragging or anything like that. <laughs> I just mean, 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 mean I, uh, that... Um, he left me a voice message a couple of days afterwards going like so excited. Oh man, I'm so happy for you. So great to hear you on there again. Like who the hell does that? Like, <laughs> oh, oh, I, oh, I can't, oh, I'll have to have you on my show again. And it wasn't that long since, um, he put our, my last appearance with him up. So very play, um, yeah, great guy. And I can see, tell why, uh, yeah. Um, people would be red pilled by him so to speak and uh, he's got quite an infectious energy um and it's it's thanks to him that i got speaking to you jeremy so yes. so very good he's been very good fortune for me uh, and for us so yeah great i mean uh, you never know i've got the the best listened podcast i've done is called only capitalism can save the planet. Socialism will destroy the earth or, or something like that. You can find it on YouTube. And that has been the subject of many a message to me. Like people have said, this is the best thing. This is the best libertarian thing on environmentalism yet. But I've got a, a few other presentations that I've done that I'm really proud of. One was more recent. It's called uh, Why Markets Work. Uh, public versus private that's also on youtube um oh man um sorry about that oh gee see i made fun of dave i made so, i made fun of dave a bunch before but the one thing he always does is he is the one who always yells before we start the show phones on vibrate everybody <laughs> right right and it's so funny because i unplugged it from the wall earlier on today and something for some reason i stupidly put it back in anyway whoever it is can wait the world can't wait for liberty, though, so that's why we've got to crack on. Exactly. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, we're, we're kissing Danilo's butt a little bit, but yeah, he's he's a great guy. But he's a, he's a great example of that of you know just going out and doing the same, just keep doing it, and people will flock to you because of you know the way you present the message. So, yeah, that's you know, like I said, for me, that's why we keep doing it over here. And that's why I continue, you know, I, I, I mean, I joke about the fact that I'm on, on, on pretty much every podcast these days, cause I do a lot of them. Uh, I just happen to, you know, I happen to have friends now that I've made because of all the different, uh, the different shows that I've done, but you know, I mean, I also have fun doing it cause heck I, you know, and we, I actually want to get into this cause it's, it's related to the stuff you talk about in your book, but I have found that I really like sitting behind a microphone and I, I would pref like I've. I used to be a writer and I got away from that a long time ago and I kept saying I was going to get myself back into it. And then once Dave originally asked me to do the podcast all those years ago, you know, I had no experience of that or anything. He's just like, Hey, you want to do a podcast with me? And I was like, all right, I'll, we'll figure this out as we go. And we did. And, you know, once I started doing that and then once I got asked to be on the freedom fiends and then I was on the radio uh, regularly, it was like, I, I found less and less desire to write because it was just so much easier for me instead of taking the time to like write something down and like think about and then look at it and try to edit it in my head and think if I can improve it and stuff like that. It's like, well, hell, I could just sit in front of a microphone and talk and then, you know, cut out the parts I don't want and keep everything else. And it's so much easier. So why don't I do that? So that's the mode I've been in for the past couple of years. And it's been a struggle to actually try to get back to writing which uh, which I've really been I've been trying really hard to do uh, recently. But uh, after reading your book today, I am now even more inspired. 
right. to get back into it. And I'm definitely going to, like, I read it quickly today. And you're right. It definitely takes two hours or less to read because I managed to finish it off in like, you know, an hour 45 or something while sitting mm. in my sitting in my ca- car waiting for uh, court sessions to, to come up. And, uh, and I definitely want to read it again because I want to try. I, I want to follow like, some of the you know the tips that you put in there and some of the strategies that you suggest people can try. Uh, I definitely want to write all those down and be and actually try to yeah, follow definitely. through with those. But the the writing thing specifically, because I know you were writing it as a more of a, a general thing, like you know the whole procrastination, like whatever you're trying to do, whether it's writing, whether it's music, whether it's whatever you are you want to do that you're not doing. But you kept mentioning writing because that's what you do. I kept yes. connecting with that because I was like, God damn it, man, this is the way I feel because like I love yakking on the microphone. And the one thing I've been told my entire life, uh, no matter how much people praised me or hated me for whatever I was doing, I was always told that I had that voice like you should be on radio one day. I was always told that uh, I even went farther than that. I used I, I had multiple times in my life. I had people ask me if I had ever considered being uh, a phone. Well, my great grandmother used to ask me if I if, why I wasn't a phone operator. Uh, she didn't understand right. that phone operators didn't really exist in the way they did back in her day. Um, <laughs> number one. Um, but besides her, I was also asked multiple times if I had ever considered doing being a sex phone operator because of my voice. <laughs> Unfortunately, oh, yeah. that was I think almost every time it was by a very older woman, like one of my friends' grandmothers. So it was kind of creepy mm. at the same time. But I was always told I had the voice, so I should use it. So I, like I said, it, it's just easier for me to do that. But I. I really really want to get back into the writing thing. And that's why one of the things like I took away right away from your book was the whole, you know, how to get over this procrastination thing. Because I, you know, I told you beforehand, like I obviously need this, I needed this book. Like you talk about it, uh, uh, that you wrote it, you know, if somebody had written this for you 10 years before that, you probably would have been in much better shape. Um, oh, no question. Yeah, me too. Cause I'm, you know, you, you joke about the whole thing about being, you know, uh, since you were out here last, it's been you know at least ten years, and that's as far as you go. I mean, I don't have a problem admitting it. We've Shane and I are kind of old fogies. We're both on the other side of forty at this point. You know, I've I've been procrastinating on stuff for way too long. So reading that right away, I connected with a thing about the writing specifically because I was like, yeah, why don't I do that? Why don't I just write? a couple minutes a day and just get in this habit because I I, look for some reason that just always slipped my mind to do that. It's always exactly what you described that it's you put this daunting task in front of you and it's like, well, I can never finish that or I'm probably not going to finish that. So why even bother starting? (laughs) Right. Yeah. There's lots of mindsets that I talk about in the book and like, as I say, if you're listening at home, be yourself and love it.com forward slash do it, download it. You can even send it to your friends. It's a free book. Um, the book it's as you said it takes maybe two hours to read Max and if you're a slow reader maybe maybe that's fine but it's quite dense in the sense that it's all killer no filler you know it's not flabby don't get me wrong it's not easy it's not a difficult read either it's not an academic textbook I worked really hard to write it as though I was just having a chat with you And most of the time spent writing the book was simplifying the passages that were a bit too um, cerebral to make them more and more chatty, adding in some jokes and things like that. And yeah, I think reading it uh, twice is a great idea. If you love it, keep on reading it as long as you're a procrastinator, a few pages here, a few pages there, because different elements of the book will appeal to you at different times. You'll definitely get some takeaways there. If there is one feedback that I've had on the book the most consistently, it's this. Reading your book is like you read my mind. So many people have emailed me or messaged me on Facebook saying, oh my God, like reading this passage is like you read my mind. And that is the best compliment ever. Um, It's very practical. It's a how-to book. It's not, I really don't like it in the self-help sphere where they pad things out with tons of philosophy and uh, conceptual information. It's like, give me the goods, buddy. Give me the goods. So, my book is like really just the goods. It's a very practical book to help you become less and less procrastinatory over time. The book doesn't promise, like, it's not a miracle. 
it's not going to take you from being a chronic procrastinator today to being incredibly productive once you've finished the book. But I think that's really its strength because it's got very realistic goals, which is if you implement the techniques that I teach in my book, Procrastination Annihilation, over a period of time, you will notice that you're becoming less and less procrastinatory and more and more productive. And you, you will notice a difference in a matter of weeks. You, you, you won't be cured of procrastination in a matter of weeks, but you will be more productive in a matter of weeks. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, I had something to say on that point, but I forgot <laughs> what. Yeah, it's, so, so that's, that's great because that's realistic. You can believe in that. Um, and uh, I know that it works. Why? Because the book teaches the method that I personally use to over come procrastination and I'm a productive guy you know I've finished another short book since since releasing that in January and I'm just oh, wow. waiting to get you know a forward written and things like that before I put that out and like I've got more stuff to finish but I used to swear that I used to think oh when am I gonna have how am I gonna get to write and my, like it was a nightmare trying to motivate myself to write now I'm taking a break but but if I took a break um before I'd had this personal transformation, I'd never get started again. Whereas now it's like, I'm cool taking a break because I know when the time's right, I can get back to writing with relative ease compared to what it was before. So yeah, I definitely, it's, you're right. If you're, you're into writing, you definitely especially want to download it because you'll definitely see your experience reflected in mine. But whatever it is, like everyone can deal with being, could benefit from being a little bit more productive. So definitely recommend it. Be yourself and love it dot com forward slash do it. That is the link to download it. Yeah. And that's the pitch. Yeah. Also yeah. in the book, in the book, there's a link there, there at the end there's links to a bunch of podcasts where I talk about uh, overcoming procrastination and increasing productivity and so if you're more of a listener if uh, then a reader there's links at the end of the book to resources that you can listen to instead where I, I share many of the ideas in the book yeah I too could actually relate to the things you said in the book as if you were reading my mind as well um, <laughs> I was raised in a family that uh, kind of instilled me with a lot of bad habits. And it's these habits that I've, you know, learned from friends and family that have kind of helped cause me to be a procrastinator. And I really liked how you talked about developing good habits to work for you instead of keeping the bad habits that work against you. Well, thank you. Would you like to give any examples of the sort of bad habits you think that you picked up? Well, like, okay, checking social media first thing in the morning. That's one thing I tend to do is because I know social media goes on 24-7 and there's a lot of notifications that pile up while you're sleeping. And I do tend to check first thing in the morning while I'm still in bed. And that kind of slows me. It causes me to delay getting out of bed and starting my day. And I think what I'm going to start doing is uh, keeping a dream journal and doing my yeah, meditation great. and yoga before I get on social media. I love that. Um, when I'm, what I want to do when I first wake up, this is an example of learning to work with yourself instead of like trying to, the, 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 trying to shoehorn or force yourself into things. Ideally, when I wake up, I want to do my meditation and breathing exercises right away. But I noticed that because I didn't want to commit to doing that for 25 minutes or however long it takes, 20 to 25 minutes. I would just lie in bed and roll around and, and maybe I would check my social media as well. But there's other things I want to do in the morning as well. So I thought, well, look, if I'm not in the mood to do my meditation as soon as I wake up, maybe I should try something else. And there's uh, something that I'm into. It's called, people can look it up if they're interested, trauma release exercises. You can look it up on YouTube. Um, I, I'm a believer. I think think practicing these exercises is very good for our mental health. Uh, and I'll, that just um, involves a little bit of physical exertion, but not very much. And I found that what I could do is I could get out of, get out of my bed and lie down on the floor and practice those exercises for 10 minutes. And that would wake me up. And then I'd be ready to do my meditation. Another thing you could do is read first, then do you. So 
uh, th- this is I know not everyone listening wants to meditate or do yoga, but this is just a really great example of finding ways to work with yourself and make things easy. I have an example in the book uh, which I use, which is many years ago I read a book called The Artist's Way, and one of the things the author recommends is that you write three pages a day in the morning. And I always wanted to do this, but I never had the willpower to do it. And somewhere along the line, I realized that um, I could journal anytime. And I'm sorry that I learned this so late because journaling is is such an uh, important practice for me. It really helps me get clear in my head and ready to take on the day. And I just started journaling in the afternoon or in the evening or just before bed just to build the habit. Now, once I had the habit, I could move it to doing it in the morning because I, cause I'm making it easy for myself instead of doing, because the morning was the worst time of the day for me. Like my, I, I didn't feel well rested, uh, drowsy. I didn't have very much willpower, etc. It was only late afternoon, evening. I was coming alive in that period of time. What you need to do is m- Use a ramp, make things easy for yourself. And the book has a series of suggestions for ramps that you can put into practice in day-to-day life to make what is difficult for you today slightly more easy two weeks from now, very much more easy four weeks from now, and so on until that's just routine. Like one of the, There's a whole bunch of stuff that I love doing every day, and one of the easiest things to do now is to do my three-page three pages of journaling I look forward to it I anticipate good outcomes for it that wasn't always the case there was a time when I found that really difficult and this is how I am able to write the book with authority because I'm a changed man things that I used to find very difficult I find relatively easy and there's other things that I still find difficult but I'm optimistic that one day they'll be a lot more easy than they are now yeah. Yeah. And I really like the part about um, first thing in the morning, not getting into that passive receptive mm-hmm. mode, because then you can carry that on throughout the day. If you start doing things that are productive, then your day ends up being more productive as well. Yeah, I I, 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 pick- I can't say, say it better than you said <laughs> it. So that's about, um, yeah, it's great to do something proactive before watching any YouTubes or listening to any podcasts or checking your Facebook notifications because those things will put you in a passive receptive state. If you want to be productive, go out for a walk, write um, write a hundred words, do something, do something generative, do something that is um, an active thing. Then once you're in the active state, you can take a break doing something passive. And after your break, you'll go back into the active state. If you start with a passive state, I find it tends to carry through the day. Yeah. I find that if if I've done a couple of things like my dream journal and meditate and then make breakfast, then I can check social media as I enjoy my breakfast. Right. Right. And enjoy. Yeah, I mean, uh, pick, picking back up on on the whole idea of uh, well, obviously, I, I definitely need to do. You still here, Jeremy? Hello. Oh, did I not? <laughs> Jeremy? Hello. Did I not unmute? Hello. Did I not unmute myself? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm looking at the recording, and and my voice is still being recorded. I'm going. Why can't they hear me? I'm I'm being picked up. I don't understand. Uh, <laughs> uh, what I was trying to say to you guys um, was that uh, the obviously the the whole. Um, Facebook thing in the morning and the social media and stuff like that's one of my worst habits and I really do need to get out of that. But the, um, you know, the, the, the just the whole, the whole idea of picking back up on, you know, what people, you know, what you said is the most common thing you hear about this, uh, you know, the, the feedback you get. And Shane said the same thing. When I kept hearing you say that in these, on these different interviews that people kept telling you, Oh, like you read my mind, like in the back of my mind, I'm going, Oh yeah. Most of these people are probably just blowing smoke, you know, just kissing his butt or whatever. And then like, I read it and I'm like, I'm smacking myself as I'm reading my go, Holy crap. It's like, how did he do this? It's scary <laughs> because like, like I said, whether it was you describing your experience, your own experiences or just talking in in general about what most procrastinators go through every every point i'm like fuck that's like that's really what it is this is really what i'm doing like why 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 don't i get over this i'm an idiot <laughs> and uh you know the the habit forming thing i i 
I definitely need to get back into because I, I obviously most of the habits I have are horrible and you hit on pretty much all of mine in the book at some point, like the video game thing. Uh, I've largely stayed away from games since my kid, like uh, after my kids turned one and they started to be more active and actually, you know, be little humans and do things. Uh, I stopped playing games altogether for years and I've only slowly gotten back into it. And I'm not that I'm definitely nowhere near as addicted as, as, uh, as I used to be. But you mentioned a lot of these things in there and I kept reading them going, damn, yeah, I, I haven't thought about it on this level, but it really is like even the point of, you know, when you're talking about, you know, d- doing all these things and setting up all these habits for yourself. And obviously, you know, starting slowly, which is another thing I really, uh, really appreciated about it was, you know, you mentioned it before the realistic goals, like that popped up multiple times in the book. And they're just like, you know, don't, obviously if you set these, if you set more realistic goals for yourself, it's a much easier to obtain them. And, you know, some people would think that it's a cop out. I think you even said this at one point, it wrote this at one point that it's, you would think it's a cop out, but no, you're, you're building your confidence because you have to, you know, if you've spent a life of mostly bad habits, you know, in order, you know, in order to reverse that, you have to first be confident that you can actually do these things. Cause if you don't, then you automatically fall back into the procrastinators motto, which is, you know, if I can't do it right away, then why did, why do it at all? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'll just get to it later. Yeah. I'll just get to it later, you know? And obviously you got to get on the ball and do that stuff. So, but like I said, it, so many things just jumped out at me right away because I'm like, damn, man, he, people weren't kidding. It it really was like you were getting, I mean, maybe all of us are just like horribly f- screwed up the same exact way and you were just able to pick up on that. <laughs> but, you know, m- like I said, most of the bad habits that you described, I could immediately point to, oh yeah, I definitely do that. And while I'm not a, uh, I've never... I've never really tried meditation. Like I've tried meditation and I never got very far with it. So it's another thing that I gave up on. It's like, oh, I'll figure that out later and never got back to it. I've never really desired to get back to it necessarily. But yoga, that's something I used to do. And I've been saying I'm going to get back into it. And I've been finding every excuse in the book recently to Mm. not get back into it. You know, mainly it's like, oh, once I move out and once I get to my new home and we get set up there, then I'm going to start my routines and then I'll be good. But reading your book was a wake up call once again to be like, you're an idiot. Why? Like, why do that? All you're doing is pushing it off again, which means by the time you actually get there, you go. Life is going to keep happening that entire time. So now you're right. gonna have you're gonna have another month, two, three, whatever, how many months it is of more problems to deal with on top of what you were already dealing with that was causing you to put it off in the first place. So like, I'm immediately like, if it wasn't for the fact that I got home with barely enough time to try to record a short video and then hop on with you guys, I was about to jump, like jump out of my suit and start doing yoga as soon as I got home. I was like, I just, I got to do it. I got to do it. So I think I'm definitely going to try to put on, I actually, the the one yoga I find I really like is, uh, I don't know if you guys, I think Shane, you might've heard, I don't know if you have uh, Anthony. It's the uh, the DDP yoga, the uh, former wrestler Diamond Dials Page. Uh, he made this yoga thing that's designed for people who have uh, injuries. Um, oh, excellent! So it's uh, you know I I have a bunch of back issues and stuff like that, um, and knee issues. So it was because it was designed for him when they thought he was going to have to stop wrestling years ago because he had messed up his back so bad. And he basically created this program that got him back wrestling for like professional wrestling for another, like 10, 15 years. I think after that was insane. Um, but yeah, I, I'm going to throw on the video tonight and do some. <laughs> You've inspired me that much that I'm actually going to do some yoga tonight, my man. <laughs> well, that's excellent. I mean, obviously, the point of the book is to help people. So anyone who le- reads it and does something practical puts it into action, that is the fulfillment of my goals. So I've, I deeply appreciate that it that it touched you. And uh, yeah, and it has touched people like... Um, the feedback has been good. People will enjoy it. Be yourself and love it.com forward slash do it. <laughs> That's where you can download it for free. Yes. And of course, we will put that show, lo- show note in the links for any, you know, that, that link in the show notes, rather, <laughs> for anybody who didn't catch that when he threw that out there. I know I know, I got razzed on one of my one of my other solo episodes because I had a guest who kept throwing out their link too. And I, I didn't care. I'm like, go for it. It just makes it easier on me. I don't have to, I don't have to say anything about it. <laughs> right. Um, but you definitely should. I mean, this is not just, I mean, we said this, I said this to you before we started the show. Uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to sound like we're blowing smoke up your rear end here, but we're really not like, I'm honestly not. And I don't think Shane is either. Like, it really, it really hit home, man. And it's, it's really, it's, 
I, I'm definitely inspired because, like I said, I connected with you. And that's another reason I'm so psyched to hope for the chance for us to hopefully meet up and hang out while mm. you're here. Because uh, I, I found a lot of connections with you right away that I'm just like, holy crap, like we have a lot in common, or at least your former mm. self and me have a lot in common. I strive oh, to be more like, I know I know you have it totally transformed, but you know what I mean? Like I would, I would probably... Uh, um, I, I strive to be more like the current version of you, but I see so much, I see so many of the similarities and I'm like, and it does like part of me reading the book was like, well, like again, smacking myself in the head. It's like, well, yeah, some of these things are like, you would think they're just common sense, but we just, I've long lost them and like forgotten about mm -hmm. them. And like, when you think about it, it's just like, oh yeah. Well, that makes sense. Why wouldn't I do that? Um, and especially, you know, we were talking about the whole libertarianism thing either earlier and how it's, you know, the most consistent position. And of course, with, with that comes the whole logic thing, which, you know, the libertarians are you know, supposed to be known for about how they think everything out logically. It's like, well, yeah, I consider myself a very logical person and I try to make all of my arguments for anything I am for or against, you know, based from a logical position. But when it comes to my own personal life, I've thrown that completely out the window because I wasn't just thinking these things through. And sometimes it just takes somebody, you know, working their butt yeah. off to write a book like this to condense everything into this short, you know, because it's only what, 70, the whole book's only 75 pages. And, but you're not kidding. You really do pack a lot um, mm. into that, into that uh, short amount of space. And uh, it is, it's really killer stuff. And I, you know, that's why I said, I was I picking on you a little bit about do, doing the uh, link constantly, but I, you know, I definitely mm. encourage other people to read this. I hope other people do because I, I know I am definitely going to uh, get my butt in gear because of this. And uh, I'm one of the worst procrastinators I know. And uh, I know plenty of other people out there that have the same issues. So uh, get on it, damn it. Yeah. I too found the material in the book very relatable. And uh, also, I used to be a, a gamer and I was particularly interested at the uh, Habitica link that you talked about. And uh, I'm actually looking forward to signing up and uh, checking that out as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Anyone who would like to go to habitica.com, it's free and I promote it in the book for no, I've not been paid or anything like that, but it's just helped me so much that I felt like I should repay the favor. It's a great little uh, app or program where you can put in the things you want to do every day and tick them off every day. It's a habit tracker and it's got some other features as well that I'm sure you'll discover. But um, yeah, I think the main problem with, for people is they think they should be better than they are or think they should be further along than they are. So if I can, let's just take right for two hours a day, then there's something wrong with me. My book is about taking your cues from reality, not trying to impose your vision of what should reality be like upon reality. It says, take a realistic assessment of where you're at now and do something that's within your capability. And if you do that, your self-respect will increase and you'll also be taking your willpower to the gym. And over time, you build uh, these things into habits and um, they become easier and easier over time. Not overnight, over time. Uh, and what I like about it, as I said before, it's very, it's all about helping you coach yourself, becoming, helping you be, uh, find out where you're at and take step as you say logically one step in the right direction you know one positive uh, one positive action is better than zero positive actions and what's more one habit one one action does not create a routine but every routine begins with one action so there's always things that you can do to be improving uh, and you can take them at your own pace you know it's it's not about um cracking a whip at yourself and uh, you know if that worked there wouldn't be any procrastinators left because most procrastinators know very well how to hate on themselves and give themselves crap for not doing more so that that method of giving yourself crap doesn't really work so it might just be time to try a new method <laughs> Absolutely. And that's another thing that actually hit home with me really hard too. And especially just hearing you uh, say that right now, because as you were saying that, I was thinking about a, about a time, about a year or so ago, where I was getting a lot of flack from a, from a bunch of people in my life because I kept referring to myself as lazy. And they're like, 
dude, you're doing and, like at that point I was doing like either I was doing podcast and or radio shows like four times a week. Um, I was single handedly managing the Facebook page for the Seeds of Liberty and like so putting out con- so I was making I was making memes daily. Um, I do all the editing and stuff for most of the shows that we do and everything like that. So I was just like constant, and and I was also finding time to get in like day long debates on Facebook and other social mm-hmm. media sites, and I was constantly doing all this stuff. And then when I would tell people I was lazy, they were like, "Dude, you're insane! You're constantly doing things." But in my mind, I was doing exactly what you're talking about. I was sure. being the procrastinator. Who's there was other things that I knew on some level yes. were, were more important, but I was yes. putting them off. But mm-hmm. I could I could at least admit it to myself by saying I was lazy. But I but right. I was actually i think in some instances i was actually looking for the reassurance from others that i wasn't because as long as they could tell me i was busy doing all these things it was kind of like eh, maybe i'm not that lazy and then once i was alone with my own thoughts again i'd be like oh damn it i'm still lazy there's so many other there's so many more <laughs> right. more important things i think i could mm. be doing or you know be- better things to better myself and therefore once i better myself better my position once i better my position i could better my kids position you know in, in mm. their lives and everything else and it's like yeah why aren't you doing these things well because when deep down I'm beating the crap out of myself because mm. yes, I am. I am lazy in a certain extent, and I know that's that. exhausting. Yeah, you 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 spe- like just the beating yourself up takes a lot of energy that you could otherwise be using to do constructive things. But I think ultimately, what's going on is that those people around you can actually see the time you spend in your own head in conflict with yourself because you know, as you said, you've got high priority tasks that you're avoiding. So it's easy for people to look at what you do do and go, wow, you know, that's great. You're editing those podcasts and things like that. But they're only seeing the front end. They're not seeing all the time where you're kind of slack, you know, having a Facebook debate when really you believe that you should be working on some project that's more important and that would be more fulfilling, but you just don't feel like you've got the emotional wherewithal to approach. And that is very depressing. Yeah. It, it, it definitely can be. And, uh, you know, that was, that was, a, the, well, you mentioned, well, there was, a, there was a couple of things I wrote, wrote down that I, I wanted to touch on too, that you've already said, but then you just said that thing too, that what you just mentioned about the whole emotional thing, that was another aspect that I hadn't actually considered. Um, the fact that it, it really is like the, it's a more of an emotional thing that you're not, that you're kind of neglecting. Um, and that's mm. why it, it's manifesting in all these other ways. And I, I hadn't considered that. And once again, once I read it, it was kind of like a smack to the head. It's like, oh yeah, duh, but makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. Um, but the other things I, I did want to mention before that we got too far away from it again, because you, you said something it's, um, you mentioned something before and it's not, uh, I, what I wrote down, actually what I wrote down was that the quote you the, the one from the book, I think that you used multiple times. Um, but I, I, I think you're right about it. The whole idea is something is better than nothing. Like doing mm. something is better than doing nothing. The first time I read it, even though I was like the first time you, the first time I came across it in the book, even though I was already like into the book and I was like, wow, this is really great stuff. Like I was instantly triggered. Because mm-hmm. my first thought when I think of stuff like that is I, I immediately go to like government and like the, the thoughts of most people. It's like, we need to do something instead of just not doing mm-hmm. anything about it. We need to do something, something. And like, that, is, it, is that always the case? But then I thought about it more. And like in, in this regard, yeah, you're right. Something is always better than nothing because it, 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 as long as you're doing something, you're working towards creating a better, at least, at least a different habit. Even if it doesn't end up being one of your good habits that you end up picking up, at at least you're changing your habits a little bit in trying to do so. And still even doing that is a positive step. So it's definitely better than doing not it's some, something is definitely better than doing nothing in that situation. And I have to, that's, I think that's going to be one of those new mantras I put in my head and I get, I, I try to get over the fact that it initially triggers me because I think of it in, in other mm-hmm. regards, but I, I think, cause there's been times in my life that I've done that, that I actually, you know, I don't meditate, but I have mantras that I've gone through through my life that I've just had to repeat to myself over and over and over again and it actually has helped me get through a lot of situations so i know that will work for me great so i think i'm gonna add that yeah, one. Med- meditation isn't for everyone so uh, don't beat yourself about oh, that yeah, no, no, I know. I, I, if you find yoga better than meditation then yoga is a form of meditation ultimately so um because i just say that because a lot of people uh think that there there's something wrong with them because they can't get into meditation it's like if you can't get into meditation try something else first for a couple of years you know it's all the same principle of making things easy for yourself and i just want to mention the context of saying doing something is better than doing nothing is important because what i mean by that is 
the reason why I put that in is a lot of procrastinators will think, oh, I, I should uh, tidy my up my room. And then they go, oh, but but I've got much more important things to do. I, I've not finished my paper yet. I, I, I should, really should be working on that. So I, I, can't, I can't tidy my room at the moment. But then they don't work on their paper and the room stays untidy for another week. And the reason why I say doing something is better than doing nothing, what I mean is if there are constructive things that you want to do, there might be some really, really, really important stuff, but you're just not there yet. Don't let that be the excuse for not doing the less important stuff, because very often doing the less important stuff can be a ramp. Oh, now that I've typed up my notes, I didn't think I was going to type up my notes because that's kind of like the easy thing to do um, compared to something that's more important and more responsible. But now that I've typed up my notes, I've got a little bit more energy. I feel like, yeah, I've done something. And now I can use that energy to do something that would have been difficult before I typed up my notes. So that's really what I mean when I say doing something is better than doing nothing. I mean, um, you know, uh, right now, Trump bombing Syria, uh, it would be better if he was doing nothing, right? Doing something isn't always yes. better than doing nothing. <laughs> but, but in the context it's intended means doing something that accomplishes your goals, uh, doing something that you've been putting off. Doing an easy thing that you've been putting off is better than doing no thing that you've been putting off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, the other thing I, I did want to mention quick uh, was because I, I was thinking about it as as you were describing um, the whole, you know, dealing with reality versus how you wish thing. You know, kind of, it's basically dealing with the situation as it is versus how you want it to be, type of thing. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I I got a lot of that from reading the book, and I've heard you talk about this too. And it, it's slipping my mind if you have talked about this on any of the podcasts because I I don't recall hearing it, but I may just be forgetting at the moment. But as I listened to you reiterate that those points again, uh, something that popped in my mind is this does seem to flow a lot from the Stoic philosophy. Mm. Is that true? Have you, has that had any in, like? Have you are you are you into stoicism at all? Um, have you studied that? Has, has this have any impact on on your thinking on this? Because it really that, that whole idea of because the whole the, the basic you know the core basic the core of stoicism is basically you know only do things that you can control within your own sphere of influence. Everything else sure. put out of your mind because you you can't control it and worrying about it and wasting time on it is just is completely mm. unproductive and you're never going to get anywhere. So that's what I thought of at first. I don't know if that's actually something that you uh, that you drew from or not. Well, I've not studied stoicism. Uh, very ardently, I mean to read Marcus Aurelius' Meditations. I've even got a, the oh, how ironic! Uh, <laughs> the book by, by uh, Epictetus, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, indeed, how ironic! There's so many books I would like of course, to read. I know, um, but I would say um, what's been called the perennial philosophy because uh, they 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 say it runs through all religions or at least the best of all religions um which is more or less you know all you have is the present moment like um uh, accept the pre accept the present moment as it is and then you can deal with it constructively it's in stoicism it's in buddhism it's in taoism it's in uh, hinduism there's a quote in the new testament where uh, jesus more or less expresses the same sentiment um, so I I am influenced somewhat by Eastern philosophy, I guess, and there is a crossover there with mysticism. Like I'm not a Buddhist, but I, I know I know about Buddhism. Uh, I like Taoism. I like um, a lot of the concepts in that one in particular is called Wu Wei, which is it's hard. To, I'm not sure how they translate it, but I like to refer to it as the doing of not doing it's like you do things the easiest way like the river the river flows down the mountain it finds the nice lowest path it finds the lowest path it doesn't work hard if it comes to a stone it flows around it it doesn't fight with the stone and that's um, a principle uh, i guess from Taoism that kind of has found its way into the book which is like 
Try and fight with yourself less. Try and work with yourself more. And if I say that to you, you can go, "Oh, that sounds like a really good idea. I'll try and uh, I'll try and work with myself less and fight with myself more." Uh, I mean, no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But 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 the, the the great thing about the book, if I may say so, is that it gives you lots of practical ways of doing that. Because if because that sounds very satisfying philosophically. The, the idea behind stoicism, which is you focus on what you can change, you work on what you can change, and you accept what you can't change, right? That's a very well-put philosophy, but how to apply that philosophy in day-to-day -day life is a much more complicated question. And you could give people lots of examples of methodologies for being better and better at accepting what they can't change and being better and better at working with what they can change. And I guess my book's uh, one of those. You know, it's going to help you to work with yourself more and fight with yourself less. Yeah. Um, I too am a fan of Taoism. And I really enjoyed what you said about being in the moment and enjoying the task at hand and uh, not focusing on what else you should be doing instead. And uh, it also goes back to the emotional aspect that you mentioned, where uh, a lot of us tend to simply avoid the things that give us anxiety instead of doing mm. the things we actually enjoy. Mm. Yeah, it's hard not to avoid the things that give us anxiety and kind of like my prescription is start with things that make you only very slightly anxious and get used to doing them until they're not so anxiety provoking anymore. You're actually expanding your comfort zone. You know, I mentioned in the book something about like we come back to writing, you know, if you're not ready to, if you've been procrastinating over your writing your novel for two years, maybe you're not ready to write a novel. Maybe you should start on things like short stories or poems or, you know, something, something that's of more uh, moderate or minimal difficulty until that comes within your power. And when that comes within your power, it'll be easier for you to work on something more challenging. Like going to the gym, you know, <laughs> no one, no one expects they're going to be able to bench press their own weight. Um, after two, three weeks in the gym, it's like you, you work with the weight that's at your, that's just slightly outside your comfort zone. And by doing so you, you build up your muscles. Well, this is, this is a gem for your willpower muscles, your productivity muscles. That's what the book is. It teaches you the exercises. Yeah, yeah, it all goes in baby steps. And I love your quote, which is related to that, uh, where you say, mile by mile, life's a trial, but inch by inch, life's a cinch. I yeah. love that quote. Yeah. Cool quote. It, it is a really but, good one. I, I know, I know, I know Danilo, uh, Danilo, Danilo picked up on that one too. He really enjoyed mm. that. I, I, I love when I hear him chuckle when he talk, when he, when he, res, when, he talk, when he says something and then laughs afterwards. So I know it really struck him, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's true though. It's again, it's one of those simple things that like a lot of people, you know, myself, you know, I'll speak for myself. I, I lost sight of a long time ago, even though in the back of my mind, I should know better that I like, I know that it's, it's so much because I, I the have thing is, Oh, go ahead. Saying you should know better or or saying I'm such an idiot. This is exactly the problem. Uh -huh. This is what creates our pro procrastination because we think we are better than we are. You know, jo Jordan Peterson uh, once gets asked, uh, you know, by someone, "What's that? What the hell is wrong with me?" And he, uh, he says, "Well, lots of things probably because there's lots of things wrong with most people." You know, most people will come and go. Oh, there's nothing wrong with you. You just have a problem. He says, "Yeah, there's probably tons of things wrong with you. There's tons of things wrong with most people." So these things, like, "Oh, I should know better." That is the pro. <laughs> Thinking you, the the fact is, you might just be so stupid and incompetent that you don't know better yet. But you know, you might be learning to know better. And if you can accept that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you are where you are. That's part of the art. Don't get me wrong. I'm not there yet. I do a lot of self-criticism. So maybe this is just something that I need to remind myself of too. But it hurts me when I hear you call yourself an idiot. Oh, well, I, I will try to refrain from doing that in, in your presence anymore because I would, I, would, I would hate to hurt you. I would hate to hurt you, Andy. But you're, you're right, though. I, I, I think part of it for me, though, if part of it for me is, and I've said this a lot uh, over the years, is I'm one of those people who was always told from a very young age that I was you know, too smart for my own good type of thing, a uh, phrase mm. used very often in my life. And a lot of times in my life, 
uh, I, I'm sure that I like the more I think about it and I, I'm going to like I said I want to read the book again and I want to absorb even more of this and I, I think I, I want to start uh, trying to implement a lot of these uh, techniques and strategies just to see if you know what happens because part of me like knows that I do know a lot of this stuff and I mm-hmm. have forgotten it and I, and but but if I, maybe if I do, instead of keep beating myself up, you're probably right. Um, it does. It, 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 I think that's the thing that's probably been missing for me because I do, it, I do, I, I know I'm not stupid in these regards. Like I know, I know for a fact, I know these things, but I just keep making some of the stu- same stupid mistakes and procrastinating mm. in the same s- ways. But you know, maybe if I now take a look at it, this from the emotional angle and go, Hmm, maybe it is. Cause I keep beating myself up over it. Maybe mm. I should stop. Uh, you know, that, that, that hopefully will help because if it hasn't changed yet, then obviously I need to do something different. And, uh, that another, again, like I said, the emotional aspect in general, I just, I hadn't considered before like everything else i like as i read it these things would smack me in the face because i was like oh yeah oh yeah makes sense or i just i did know that i had just forgotten it temporarily type of things but the emotional thing right like that was the one that hit me i was like hmm this is the one i've definitely never considered and that probably has something to do with my overly logical nature i mean we've i've talked about this uh openly before i i'm what is is referred to as an aspergertarian uh a name a couple of us made up for ourselves because there's a there's like a, a stereotype about uh, libertarians and anarchists that they're very, mm. uh, they, they, they could be like on the autism spectrum type of thing because of their adherence to logic and they seem to be heartless. You know, that's how a lot of people view view libertarians from the outside. Um, I am one of those people who actually was though. Uh, I actually do have Asperger's mm. as far as I know. And uh, I was never officially diagnosed, but I was told by three people in the industry as I met them throughout my life, their first question, one of their first questions to me was, have you ever been tested? <laughs> Right. <laughs> so, uh, and it fits with everything else. Cause I've, I had to teach myself empathy at a, at a, at a, a later stage in my life. Cause I just didn't have any. And like, I thought there was something wrong with me, but apparently it was just, yeah, I was just kind of born different. Um, but yeah, I, so I overlook the emotion for, because of all that, I tend to overlook the emotional aspects and a lot of things. And again, like it not, to the extent of triggering me, but another term you used in the phrase, uh, a term you used in the book a couple of times, which um, is is relatable to this too, the whole woo-woo thing. Um, Mm. You mentioned that a bunch of times and and Shane, I pick, that's Shane, that's my nickname for Shane, has been for a long time because- He accuses me of being woo-woo. Oh, you know, you know I mean it with love because you know, know. you know, we we have great, we've had discussions about a lot of this stuff. I'm not as close-minded as I used to be. Um, But just that whole idea, like a lot of these things, I guess in the back of my mind, I still attribute to like, you know, not that it's like woo, but like anything like emotional, anything like that. It's like, oh, I don't need mm-hmm. to deal with that because the um the logic guy. So put that to the mm-hmm. side. So yeah, I I definitely overlooked that a lot, and I think that for me personally, I think this that's probably right now after the first reading, it's probably the biggest takeaway for me. Um, is that I I, I really think I I need to focus more on that, uh, because I just I definitely don't. Um, and the most, the, the, the most regular emotion that comes out of me is, uh, anger. You know, there's, there's a reason I, the angry young man by Billy Joel was my, made my theme song by the time I was eight and it's stuck with me the ever, ever since. Oh, I love that song. Oh, one of my favorite songs what of a, all time. What a great freaking song. Yeah. I mean, the piano playing in the angry young man by Billy Joel and such a recognizable character as well. What a great song. People should check that out if you've not heard it before. (laughs) But yeah, so if you're the logic guy, it's easy to try and steamroll over your emotions to get things done, but it won't work because you've basically got there, you know, you're trying to pull a horse when the horse is digging its heels in and the emotions are more powerful than your logic is. The Scottish philosopher David Hume said, reason is and should be, only be, should always be, I can't remember the exact quote, the slave of the passions. And what he meant by that is that um, that you, you, you use your logic, you use your reason to uh, fulfill your passions without any passion, um, without any emotion, what, what exactly is your reason there to do? I mean, At the end of the day, you want something, you desire something, and you move towards that goal. That's what organisms do. From the the most tiny uh, singular-celled organisms move 
towards food and away from toxins. And this is this. The, what is that? Uh, with our higher desires, the desire to write a book, the desire to publish a po- podcast, other than a passion. Then you use your reason to attain. To attain. So. Um, uh, if you you need to deal with the emotional, and I guess I could be uh, guilty or indicted of being uh, ultra rational at times and things like that. Uh, the, there was a need for me to write this book um, in a way to catalog what I'd learned uh, and uh, the reason why people can read it and go, wow, man, it's like you've read my mind, is because I catalogued what was going on in my mind somehow over years and somehow I managed to put it into 25,000 words. You know, it's quite proud of it, I have to say. When I read it back, I like the way it reads. It reads very nicely. Yeah, well, uh, I, I, I for one think you definitely should be proud of it because it, it definitely mm-hmm. does. You know, every everything, pretty much like you know, I, I don't any of the podcasts I've heard you talk about this or anything I've listened to you talk. You know, and and now that I've it was the one one of the really handy things about the book, aside from the links that you put in there, like you were talking about earlier at the end of the book, the fact that you stuck links for specific videos of yours that that uh, that connected with things that you were talking about at the book. Like I was able to sit there on my phone and go straight from reading to like, oh, I'll take a break for a second and watch this watch this 10 minute video on, on one and a half speed and boop right back to reading the book again uh which was great um great but uh yeah the the, the they, they definitely uh like i said i i think it's people uh definitely would get a get a lot out of this definitely worth reading and you should you should be proud because you know you talked about the fact that you it took you a while to hone the ability to write the way, like the way, the, the fact that you're so proud now of how you wrote this book, because you used to be very, you know, you had to tone, you, you had to get, you know, you're a very verbose writer at first and you had to like kind of pare everything back and get, get yourself down to where you could write uh, more, less complex sentences, I think, as you yes, put it. Yes, definitely. Which, which is, again, is another thing that hit home with me because that's always been my problem. I write very similarly to the way I speak. And I tend mm. to speak in very long, complex sentences. Just it just I don't like I'm not trying to sound like some I've been accused of trying to talk down to people, try to sound smarter than other people. It's really not the case. It's just the way I learned on yeah. my own. So that's how I speak. And I don't mean anything by it, but I write the same way. So there was like when I, I I have one piece that I wrote recently that I'm, you know, like you were talking about, like actually being able to read back that and be extremely proud of what you wrote. Like I have mm-hmm. one piece recently that I published uh, that I'd actually been working on, you know, talking about procrastination for over two years. <laughs> and, mm. and it was, it was only like, oh, a, you know, it was only like a, 8,000 word essay or something or 10,000 words. I don't even like a, maybe 4,000 words. I don't remember. It wasn't like super, super long, but, but it was something that just took me, um, you know, way too long to actually put out. And, uh, but, I, but I can re- look back at that and be proud of it. But even still, I know that I still have those problems where, cause I, I, a couple of, including actually Danilo was one of them, but a couple of friends that are writers that I really trust, I gave it to them first and said, please be brutal. You know, I haven't written in a long time. So don't sugarcoat it. Like, tell me what I want to improve. I want to get better. Please, you know, tell me, help me here. And, uh, my one buddy, Paul, uh, Paul Gordon, friend of the show, uh, been on a bunch of times, a uh, great guy. He actually was probably the most critical, um, which I su- I really appreciated, but that was one of the things he kept hitting me with is like, dude, you gotta, he's like, I know, he's like, I know what you mean and I know how you think. So this coming from you, this makes perfect sense to me, but other people reading it, it's just way too long. Mm. He's like, I don't want to say long winded, but it's long winded, you know, that type of thing. And it's like, yeah, man. It, but you, like you said, it, just doing things like getting in the habit of starting writing, even if it's just writing for the sake, just to be writing every day. So you get in that habit, mm. um, you know, once you get to that point, okay, now you can start, you know, now you're in the habit of writing. Now you can start yeah. working on the writing that you do and you hone mm-hmm. it and you hone it and you hone it. And because you've already made it easier for yourself. And again, that's something I know I need to get over because you were talking about before mm-hmm. about, you know, if you've put that novel, you've been working, you know, have that idea for a novel for two years, you haven't got anywhere with. I have a book that I've been, you know, a book that I was going to write. Um, I started talking about a couple of months ago and it's something that would only end up being around the length of yours. So not like, I'm not talking about writing a novel. I'm talking about writing a book, but I haven't gotten any, I haven't even written an outline yet 
because mm. I haven't gotten the, I haven't gotten myself in the habit of writing again. I just mm. these days I write because I'm on Steam it. So I've I've tried to start mm. blogging more. But it's essentially when mm. something strikes me, I'm like, oh, I'll write right now because something's in my head. But other than that, it's not a routine. And again, this should like I said, I, I I'm trying not to call myself an idiot, but it should I believe that this should be common sense to me because I do know this that the way my mind works. I actually do work much better if I'm in a routine. I am. So, I sure. know I'm so much more productive, but I've just gotten away from it for so long and gave given every excuse in the book. First, it was my business, then it was my kids, you know. And I'm always placing the blame. Oh, well, I have to do these things. It's like, yes, it's true. Yeah. I do have these things to do, but that shouldn't stop me from doing these other things. The only thing that is stopping Especially me if is me. High priority. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So. You need to know what your values are, and and if it's something that you value, it needs to get some kind of precedence, even if that's just twenty minutes to start with. Writing twenty, writing for twenty minutes. If you write for twenty minutes a day for two weeks without missing a day, you'll be incredibly proud of yourself. And if you can manage to do it for four, six weeks, it'll start to get a lot easier. It'll start to become some uh, part of your routine. And again, if you apply the easy me- the, the method of making it easy which is at first you just make sure you write that before you go to bed any time of the day but see once you're in a routine you're four or six eight weeks into it you you've been writing for 20 minutes a day you rarely miss a day then you're like okay well i've got this writing for 20 minutes a day right now i want to make sure that i do it before mi- midday or something like that well, obviously, if people work regular jobs, that's that's not going to. But 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 I'm just I'm just expressing the principle. So yeah, it might just be that you're not ready in terms of confidence wise to write your short book. And what you could do is, you know, some of the things you're going to cover in the book, you could start writing short articles that cover bits of the information in the book, so that when you come to write the book, you can uh, steal bits of your own work, put it in new words and uh, repackage it. You know, there's all sorts of ways to make things easy for yourself. Um, and the, that, that's the way to do it, man. Make it easier for yourself. Exactly. <laughs> Nothing I love more than I, plagiarizing myself. <laughs> right. Yeah. I love how it's not necessarily about finishing something, but just getting started. And then right. once that you've gotten so started, hard. you get the experience and that gives you the confidence to do it again. That is the most difficult thing for most people getting started, which is why I recommend if there's something you want to do, you make a practice of getting started each day because you just need to get used to getting started. Like if I start working on another book, I will not be thinking about finishing the book. That's what I used to do before I had a book finished. I was thinking, oh, I need to finish a book. Like when am I going to have one finished? And it took me years. (laughs) Whereas, um, uh, the thing is, now it's like my only concern will be to make sure that I do a certain amount of writing every day and it'll be finished when it's finished. I built up a routine of writing for half an hour a day first um, for over six months. And then when I was writing in this book, I did two to three hours a day, five days a week. It's no problem for me. Um, it felt very natural by this point because I'd worked on something until it became easier. So when, once I had something to focus my mind on, it was easier to increase the amount of time. But it wouldn't have been easier to do two or three hours a day, five days a week, if I hadn't had the discipline of writing for 30 minutes a day uh, for over six months, rarely missing a day. Yeah, sometimes I missed a day, but I got back on the wagon. Well, yeah, and because like you said earlier, once once you get to a certain point, it, it has started to form as a habit. So you ca- so even if you do miss a day, it's not like oh my god, I got to start all over again tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. No, you just you like oh, I took a day off, no big deal. Now I'm right back in the swing of things, you know, which yes. which also ties all the way back into the beginning of the conversation about you know your your upcoming trip and how you're finally at a point where you can say, hey, I want to take a trip for purely leisure, and mm-hmm. it's you could because you, you're not 
you're not super concerned about falling back into all these bad habits just because sure. you take a little time off because you've worked so hard to put yourself to to you know to alter your to life into the, to this point and now be in this position that it's like oh yeah I know I I'm confident that I can afford to have a little leisure mm-hmm. time and actually enjoy it because that's another thing you reference most multiple times in the book about you know the fact that you know a lot of even if you're doing things, even if you're trying to be productive and then you take time off, a lot of times you're not actually enjoying your leisure time because you're so focused, like you're still thinking about the other thing that you're not doing or you're or, or right. that, you, that you could be doing. So like your leisure time ends up being more wasteful than not because you end up more drained from it because you've been worrying about things the entire time. And I could definitely relate to that, too. So all, all great stuff. Um, but I am looking at the time and I don't want to keep you too long because I know it's a lot later on your side of the pond right now. <laughs> um, so we should probably get closing out. But first of all, thank you once again for coming on. This was this was so much fun. I am so glad that we got a chance, not not just to have you on the show, but actually have this conversation. Because um, like I said, I'm I'm taking this as a therapy session for myself. <laughs> right. And I'm, um, I'm really, really pulling a lot, a lot out of this. So before we get going, though, um, do you have anything you want to say in closing? And of course, plug plug away once again. Well, I first I want to thank you guys so much for having me on the show, but not just for that, for your like genuine interest in my work. Like it's lovely to speak to people who are like, oh yeah, I like your book and uh, bring up the things because everyone has said different quotes or different parts of the book affected them. And it's very touching, very flattering to know that this is a real conversation. It's not like you're some radio host that, um, interviews 10 people a day and has given been given a speck of what to ask like the fact that you guys actually took the time out of your day to read it that's like really awesome and you asked me questions from the heart so thank you very much for that if you want to keep up with my work at home the best way is just download the book be yourself and love it.com forward slash do it because inside the ebook there are links to scottish liberty podcast be yourself and love it podcast which is my personal development podcast link to my youtube channel where i've got very short videos that might be um of some benefit everything is in the book so just download the book uh, be yourself and love it.com forward slash do it and inside that book you find what else i'm up to and whatever you're interested in check it out whatever you're not interested in um don't <laughs> what else can i say excellent thank you so much once more oh you're quite welcome quite welcome anthony uh shane you have anything uh, you want to say before we close out Sure. I just wanted to say that um, Anthony should be proud of this book because I really feel that it's kind of a masterpiece of sorts. And I'm not only going to reread it again, but I'm going to recommend it to my friends and family as well. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm definitely going to do the same. And uh, I may just actually send it to some people. <laughs> yeah, please, please. Yeah, same at home. If you If you know anyone who could benefit from it, pass it on. You know, the more the merrier. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So once again, thank you so much, Anthony. This has been great. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been the Seeds of Liberty podcast. All of our information can be found at solpodcast.org. Uh, if you would uh, like to contribute to our cause over here, of course, hashtag please donate. The Patreon is still up and running. Uh, thank you again to all our patrons who continue to uh, help us out every month. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, I do apologize. We missed an episode uh, last week uh, because of things going on in my life, but I promise that two will be out this week, so we'll be all caught up again. And also check out the additional perks that we've added if you haven't already because we've started offering more stuff and there's opportunities for listeners to record live and uh, a bunch of extra episodes episodes we've been putting out so thank you everybody once again we will uh catch you next week peace
This is Daryl W. Perry, host of Free Talk Live. This November, I'll be running in the world's biggest and most popular marathon, the New York City Marathon. And I've accepted a spot on Team Innocence Project because I'm a passionate supporter of their work. Since 1989, 353 people in the United States have been exonerated by DNA testing, including 38 who pled guilty to crimes they did not commit, and 20 of whom served time on death row. The Innocence Project provided direct representation or critical assistance in 180 of these cases. With your help, the Innocence Project can help even more people who have been wrongly convicted. As part of Team Innocence Project, I am raising awareness about wrongful convictions and raising funds to help free the innocent. I've already paid the race registration fees. However, to secure my spot on Team Innocence Project in the New York City Marathon, I need to raise $3,500 by November 1st. You can support the Innocence Project and help me secure my race entry by going to run.freetalklive.com.